Hello and welcome back after a long break to Bitwise, day 61 there and back again. Um, so as I'm sure everyone who's been following along in real time has noticed, there's been a very long break. Uh, there's a longer story behind it. I think I'll maybe talk about it on a later episode, but uh, suffice it to say, I am back. Um, however, we probably, uh, actually we will certainly not continue right where we left off. Um, if you recall, we were in the midst of some sequential logic with FIFOs using our own, you know, uh, HDL. Uh, and this was, I guess, back in late August. Um, my plan for, we will get back to that for sure. Uh, this will be the next topic after the current one. But there's something I want to return back to, uh, probably for at least a month, maybe a month and a half. And uh, that's things related to the ION compiler and... Um, and sort of not just the compiler itself, but tools that are based on it. Um, so, you know, we wrote the compiler in C and it was always the intent that it be rewritten in ION to be self-hosted. Um, the, 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 I think if you go back and look at some of my early, early strategy episodes, I talked about why self-hosting was part of the roadmap. It had to do with, uh, you know, cross-compiling using the C-based compiler and then deploying the cross-compiled compiler on the target itself where it can actually compile on the target uh, to the target and stuff like that. Uh, Self-hosting would certainly have that benefit, but for me, one of the main reasons I want to focus on rewriting the compiler in ION is uh, basically twofold. First is there are some parts of the compiler that need to be cleaned up, partly for uh, in preparation for the RISC-V backend, partly in preparation for um, just becoming more of a library basically so that it can be used um, uh, as a component for tools um, you know like IDEs refactoring tools all the kind of stuff that you associate with with a modern language stack um, like even basic stuff like not having globals for uh, for a lot of these kind of shared state that kind of thing needs to be handled um, and there's also stuff, I mean, I would say especially in terms of like supporting other backends, one of the things right now is because the C generating, uh, code generating backend is uh, so AST based, uh, it mostly gets data from the resolver beyond the AST sort of through side channels, like various hash maps and stuff. Uh, a lot of that was kind of done incrementally and it's fine for what it is, but uh, it's not really sufficient for some of the the longer term goals of the of what the compiler will be used for, specifically the risk five backend, but also you know if you want to do refactoring tools that um, don't just want to work with the AST, um, we'll, we'll need sort of a, sort of a cleaner interchange format between the resolver and various backends and, and downstream consumers. And so taking that all into account, I thought it would actually make sense rather than improving the compiler in C, let's do everything at once. Uh, Let's actually rewrite the compiler in ION uh, using the existing C-based compiler to compile the new compiler. Um, not switching over to the new compiler until everything is super great, of course, um, but uh, kind of proceeding like that. Um, the other benefit is well, it will kind of help me get back into the swing of things. There will be a lot of just kind of typing, basically, a lot of uh, copy and paste and just kind of getting things to work. Uh, especially in the beginning, because I anticipate that the lexer and the parser will be almost purely copy and pasted. I think there, will, I mean, some, some, most of the changes to that will be around kind of making them more modular and standalone components. But there's not much about the lexer and parser code I would actually change. I think uh, when it gets to the resolver, you know, uh, I think the big thing is just changing some of the data structures. Right now, it generates this data structure called an operand which uh, is not heap allocated. It's only used to communicate sort of uh, down the call stack. And probably something along these lines has to be turned into an actual operand tree that has some persistence and uh, can be handed back to the uh, downstream to the, the back end or, uh, or, or other tools um, so that we don't just have, you know, the AST, which is great. Like the AST is pretty much how it should be. And then we have these ad hoc side channels for resolve types and, um, resolve symbols and stuff like that. So, so, so that stuff will probably have to change. I don't think anything, I don't think the resolver itself will change the fundamental way it works, but the data structures and the data flow will definitely change. But before we get there, um, you know, we'll have to basically get the lexer and the parser ported. We will have to get a bunch of their, uh, their, uh, 
of, of the library functionality, like we have stretchy buffers, we have various kinds of allocators, we'll have to get those ported. We'll have to figure out, um, well, and sort of a, a secondary purpose of doing that is to kind of uh, pull out some pieces for standardization and the standard library along the way, at least proposals for, for that. Uh, anyway, all kinds of stuff. So that's the plan for at least the next month, month and a half. Um, I think the actual refactoring will proceed faster than that because most of it is just porting code. So let's say there's 10,000 lines of code. At least 5,000 of those lines is just uh, almost copy and paste and clean up. Um, so that will proceed pretty quickly. Other parts will be more extensive uh, and also more intricate, like the resolver is by far the most complex part of the, the code base. Um, but that part will, let's see how long it takes, but, I, but that won't take up the bulk of the time. Really what I'm excited about is getting the compiler in a really pristine shape as a library that everyone can use for tools, including myself, um, and then actually building tools on top of it for kind of quality of life. Uh, and so that's hopefully what's going to take the bulk of the time, maybe two, three weeks for the first part, and then another three weeks for all the, the cool tools that we can build on top of it. And then maybe we'll cap off with a RISC-V backend. So that might be a good way to get back into the hardware side is to cap off by spending another, I don't know, two, three weeks on the RISC-V backend after all of that is done, and then circle back to hardware. And uh, anyway, so that's a tentative plan. We'll see how it goes. Um, but this will get me back into ion programming. Alrighty. So let's see. Um, let's just go and look at the existing compiler code quickly to get an idea of what the scope will entail and, and talk about some of the things that will sort of have to change based on the goals. Um, So right now, you know, the compilation pipeline, if you will, is uh, is pretty straightforward. It's kind of standard uh, for a uh, a two-pass compiler. You have uh, you know a lexer that is demand uh, driven by a parser that produces an AST. The AST is uh, is I guess it's actually a, uh, yeah it's a I guess it's actually a three-pass uh, compiler right now. You, you generate the AST, uh, the resolver basically type checks and type, you know, infers types, uh, sanity checks, uh, resolves symbols and all this other stuff. Um, and then the, um, the generator traverses the AST one more time to generate. Um, well, that, that's the true for the current generator because it generates C. It's, it's very AST centric. So it traverses the AST, generates corresponding C code, basically queries, uh, queries the uh, some of the sideband information from the resolver like the resolve types so if if you know if you're um, in any time uh, you're in a context where which is a lot uh, where you need to know the resolve type that's not really there in the AST that's something that the resolver figured out and so the the, the generator uh, asks for that sort of on demand um, and you know th that that general split will continue in in the new compiler. Basically, that that, that high level architecture is not going to change probably. But um, anyway, the first parts we'll be looking at uh, in this pipeline is the lexer and the parser. The lexer is the very first thing we wrote. It'll be the very first thing we port. Um, the big thing that will change is that it's going to become standalone. So. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it basically means I want to be able to do something like this. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there will probably be various front end functions, but certainly you want to be able to just basically say, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, let's say uh, create lexer from stir um, just to be specific about the types let's say you get back a uh, you get this le lexer struct um, and then at this point you can do stuff like uh, 
next token. Uh, well, I guess there's a current token. There's a current line. Current column. Uh, Maybe some of these are actually accessor based. Like for example, for the column, you might not want to store that explicitly. Maybe that's just inferred by a pointer, but uh, by some arithmetic. But whatever, let's just say it is. But the the point is, a lot of these things right now. If you if you look here, these are global variables. Uh, let's see. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, the stream, this is just the cursor that we don't, well, I guess you can expose that externally if you want, um, but that's more of an internal thing. The thing you care about if you're uh, trying to use the Lexer is you want to know what the current token is and you want to be able to advance, uh, advance to the next token and know when there's nothing more. Uh, you also want to be able to um, kind of handle errors in a clean way. So there's going to be a question about um, how errors are kind of reported to the client. Like right now, we kind of have a global error reporting system um, where everyone just calls into these global functions for reporting errors. Uh, that won't do when we have more of a modular system. So the question then is, is it callback based? Is it more like a log? Um, there's definitely something to be said about the callback based approach as long as you don't abuse it um, because it makes it easy to, for example, hook up a shared handler for the Lexer and the parser and stuff like that. And, and it can basically do the equivalent of what we're doing here now, uh, if, if that's what you want. So maybe, uh, you know, there will be a way to register uh, error handlers um, rather than just presuming that there's a shared global handler. Um, and stuff like that. So uh, of course the, the thing that has to change in the actual code is that these can't just reference this global state directly. They actually have to pass that context around uh, so they can can get to the data they care about. Um, but the, I, I would consider all of this kind of standard modularization. Um, um, but that's uh, probably the place to start. Let me just scan through here and see if there's anything sensitive. Most of these functions are internal. Um, I don't think you want to consider these part of the interface. I think what you want to consider part of the interface is basically next token, the ability to access these things. Again, whether these are actually fields or functions, uh, I, I, I always am partial to just having the data be there directly. Uh, so I'm probably am going to lean towards that. Uh, I think that also matches the current design. Um, Next token, right? That's so. That's really the main entry point for that. I think there's some other, right? So then there's some conven convenience functions like this. A lot of these things are technically not part of the Lexer. Uh, you might actually want to. I mean, we can put them in the Lexer package if we want, but just like we're doing it here, I guess. But conceptually, these are not really part of the Lexer. I mean, you can see they don't access global state. These are just sort of pure functions that query various features of tokens. Some of these are kind of convenience things. Uh, I remember one thing I realized when I was kind of uh, just scanning through this code kind of to, to jog my memory about uh, about things is um, a lot of this stuff that's here actually belongs in the parser. Um, like for example, this function here, expect token, that's actually not a lexer. Like, I think I put it here just because it seems like it should be proximate to the lexer, but this is actually not a lexer function. This is a parser function. Um, like, I, I think you see why, right? Like the idea of having this specific way of interacting with it in this style. I mean, you could put it in the parser module, but I don't think it actually is. Uh, I mean, maybe you want to just for convenience. That's fine, but in some sense, this is like, if you think about it, like once, I think part of the reason it's like this right now is because everything is global state. But for example, if you wanted, let, let me just copy and paste it over to show you what I'm talking about. If you wanted, once we move to the world where thing where the different contexts are a little bit more uh, explicit and decoupled, um, you actually want something like this, um, I think. Um, uh, 
Oh wait, this token is actually I think you want something more like this because if you think about the purpose of this function it's to be convenient for the parser and so you want this function to also know how to get given you know given the parser context how to get to the lexer context so that, that's why i think stuff like this actually once you remove this sort of free for all free love uh the global state fest then um i think some of this stuff will actually move into the parser but um but all the core stuff below, I mean, I guess the reason it's at the bottom of the file is, is partly because of that. But basically everything before here will go into the the Lexer module. Um, all right. And yeah, the Lexer might be a good place to start because I don't think it has many dependencies. I guess we do use interning, right? Um, We'll probably be doing a bunch of sort of pushing and popping of the stack as we're uh, as we're dealing with these issues because some of the dependencies like you know string interning, stretchy buffs, I have kind of partial plans for how to do them cleanly. Uh, I also have a new data structure variant that I want to talk about. Um, maybe we'll do that today. Um, but anyway, so that's where we are for that. Let me just see if this solution still compiles because I may have typed in random characters. God knows where. Um, I don't even remember how to look at shortcuts now. What is it? Control Alt F7. <clears throat> Wow. Okay. Well, that's nice. Um, let's see. I guess I created this project. Oh yeah, that's someone else. I forgot that someone already did this. I should I should mention that because that would be rude of me also. I haven't actually looked at this code, which is embarrassing. Someone actually, this is a long time ago, basically I think as a typing exercise, but actually, and I think he didn't actually test it. I think he just got it to compile, actually ported the existing code over, which is more patience than I would have. Uh, and I already told him when he, I think he'd already done it by the time I talked to him or almost finished it. Uh, so, so props to that guy uh, whose name I forget right off the top of my head. But basically, um, the um, um, maybe I'll look at this later. But basically, the reason I, I and I told him before before he did extra work that uh, I part of the reason. Well, basically, like I like I talked about right at the start of the stream. I don't. I want to rework a bunch of stuff. Uh, so the idea of copy and pasting stuff over was not, um, like quite as literally porting it quite as literally as he did while, while impressive is not really what I want to do, but I would be curious to see how he did a few things just out of curiosity. Like, like, how did he do the interning? Uh, I remember all these shortcuts, F12. Okay, so it's confusing about Oh yeah, TJ Palmer. Uh, that, that's who it was. Which is crazy. Um Okay, so he yeah, he, he ported a lot of this stuff pretty literally. Um I'm trying to remember because I, I know that I talked about how you can do stretch. I actually have, I think, a better idea about how to do stretchy buffs in Ion now. And I, it may it involves additional compiler support. 
um, for a few things, but not fundamentally changing the type system. Um, but yeah, let's see. So how did he do? Right, so explicit element size, but how does he get the element size for push? Okay, so he just passes it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, he, he noticed this. Uh, I have a solution, actually. Maybe let me talk about that first, because that requires compiler changes um, to make it work. Okay, um, to warm up, so he says, we need templates or macros to make this better generic. I have an idea. Um, I have, I think, something that will work even better if you're allowed to cheat a little bit. Um, but anyway, let's, let's see here. Um, if you go to test1.ion, which, oh, I guess that's actually in this project, so I should open that up. If you recall, we have this whole static type ID stuff, which is a 64-bit token, which um, encodes information, has information that can both be used as a key into a dynamic type info table, but also contains a static type info. Um, so for example, and, and, and I never put in the alignment, but that's very easy. If you dedicate four bits to alignment and you assume it's a power of two, you can get up to 32K alignment expressed here very easily. But anyway, uh, the idea is, you know, it contains the size, it contains the kind of thing, and then the index, which is what you use for dynamic type info, assuming you compile with that in. But the point is there's ability to get static type info without compiling in any extra table data. And the way things are set up basically is if you don't compile in the table, then when you call this get type info function with that type ID, you just always get back null. Um, but anyway, you can use this for certain kinds of polymorphism. Um, and right now, if you look at any, so any, Right now, uh, as far as the compiler concerned, any is nothing special. Um, where is it defined? Oh, type info. Right. Any is really nothing special right now as far as the compiler is concerned. It's just, you know, a, a pointer and a descriptor, the type ID being the descriptor. Um, but we had some test cases for that already. Sorry, auto hide that thing. Um, you know, you can do this kind of thing, and this doesn't require any dynamic type info. This just relies on, um, yeah. So aside from extracting the size and stuff, you can see that you can also just do numerical comparisons like this um, to test against a, a finite set of possibilities. Um, but the way you actually use this right now is you have to, which is not too bad in many cases, but you have to explicitly construct a type of, uh, you have to explicitly construct a type ID. And of course there's the shortcut, you just call type of on something. But um, one thing I want to do is do something like the equivalent of void, uh, void star implicit conversion for any, where basically I should be able to just write uh, anytime you expect an any, I should just be able to write this and it will do the equivalent of this. And in the case where you call something with an R value, it should create an L value literal. So for example, th th this should be, uh, I'm just gonna put it in comment so it won't miscompile right now until I fix it. Um, so you should be able to do this and it will do exactly the equivalent to this. Uh, you should also be able to do this for um, even R values where you can't take their address and it will generate an L value. This is an IC99 feature. You can actually always generate an L value literal even for these sort of R values. So if you have an R value, you can generate, you can use an L value literal um, and then take the address of that. 
um, and do something like this. So let me just write this. This should do something like this. This should do something like that. So this is actually a very minor type system change. Uh, I looked at it a little bit the other day just to see whether there was something non-obvious. The main thing we need to do in order to enable this is really just to extend the type conver conversion lattice to basically allow anything, um, literally anything to be converted to any as far as the type system is concerned. And then in the back end, we just need to detect when we need to uh, wrap things in this way. Um, and uh, I will probably do that in a, I will, con I, you know, because we've already have all these side channels for communicating between the resolver and the generator, I will feel even less hesitant about doing that for new features we need between now and when the new compiler is finished because the new compiler will have a better way of doing it and so all of those hacks will be temporary basically so they they they, they burden me even less than they would normally um and so uh for today actually before we start porting the lexer let's um let's let's do this i i i guess in the, in the next few weeks a lot of it will be kind of back and forth as, as we encounter stuff we need uh to, to support what we want to do in a clean way so uh and this is something that I know we'll want for other things. So let's actually make this compiler change right now. Um, so let's see. I have to get used to all these shortcuts. I totally screwed up my muscle memory. Um, all right. Um, boom, 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 boom. So I th think the way all this works is through convert operand. Uh, by the way, the other thing I promise I'm going to do is when we actually get to the resolver, which I think is the only, right now, some parts of the generator, but it's the only really compl complicated, non-trivial part of the compiler, I promise to uh, write short comments for stuff that's not obvious. It'll be a lot easier for me to do it in the second pass because I've forgotten a lot of the details, and so I'm kind of much better at judging what uh, what is an appropriate level of detail in commenting. It's something that I find very hard to do in the first pass. Um, so that will also be a side effect of the conversion. But uh, I won't do that right now. We will do that once we actually port the resolver. There's no point in commenting something that's going to go away anyway. Um, boom, boom, boom. Right. So the way this works is you have an operand and you do an in-place conversion. So you specify the type that it wants to, you want to convert it to. I guess there's also cast operand for more explicit casts. It checks whether it's convertible, and then it casts it, and it, it does this in place. So it actually changes the type of the operand in place. Um, you can see here, sets the type to the unqualified version of the target type and removes the L value status. Because, of course, for example, if I convert from an int L value to, say, a long L value, you can't you don't now have an L long or L long, the long, long L value, because you, if you try to assign through it, you're going to clobber memory after the original memory. So uh, you always lose L value in S when you do these conversions. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right, so let's look at this function. Is convertible. So we look at the unqualified destination type the unqualified off-ramp type. And this is basically from the C standard. Um, Let me think about something. Well, you can certainly just, actually, be, be, before we do this, let me verify that the test code actually doesn't compile, because then I'll make it compile.
Oh, I'm running the wrong solution, I guess. Right, right, right. Um, boom, 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 boom. The wrong project. Right. So without this, It, it, I always have this uneasy feeling when I run code, even though I know I haven't touched it, but when I run code, I haven't run it forever, and it works, I'm like, that's a little suspicious, but I mean, I haven't touched it, so it should still work. Um, okay. I need to completely just figure out some of these dependency issues with uh, okay. All right, yeah, so doesn't accept this. Now let's go and, okay, so one, one problem we're going to run into is that we don't really have a, a way of saying um, if source type is whatever. Like we want to be able to say if the destination type is any, then allow the conversion. Um, by the way, I think we need both any and any const for modifiable and non-modifiable values. Like, um, but anyway. Um, so the question is, how do we get that information in? I think we already do that for some things like type info. Don't we have somewhere uh, is it types? What is it? Type dot C. Yeah. Um, boom, boom, boom. Like basically, we need to resolve a symbol in the built in namespace. Um, at startup, so we can only do that once. We can only do that once. It's actually right. So we have the built-in package. I basically need to look up a symbol corresponding to the type in the built-in package. Um, So how do we do that? Do this one. This has to be an intern name. So let's say well. Maybe no need to really use a temporary for that. Um,
Oh yeah, it's because I, I, I am such a moron when it comes to Visual Studio build stuff. I, I need to get someone who actually understands this shit. I need to deep dive myself because the way I have some of the like I think I I don't know why, but like I have the test.ion as a pre-build step, and so it's, I, if I actually have an error here, I can't compile the compiler, which is fucking stupid. Um, or I can compile it, but I can't run it, or something like that. Okay, what what is it now? Well, Visual Studio is mostly fine when you have your stuff set up correctly, but I don't. Um, oh, it's because, sorry, that's my bad. I guess I should really do this. Okay. Okay, so Okay, so there's no package. I guess because Is it enter package? Is it leave? package <clears throat> um So it's incomplete. That's fine because it has identity. Um, actually, let's check something again. Okay, so let's just make this global here. Since we're still in the, the Woodstock Free Love Fest global state 2019 here, those days will be over in the new compiler, but for now, let's, let's enjoy it while we can. Uh, All right. Do, 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 do. So now we should be able to say else if dust is any type, um, then return true. So of course, this will only make the type check pass. Now the What? This is a type. This is a type. Oh, it's not visible. 
Uh, see what's the order of these things. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, I guess this is very last. I mean, it's totally fine. I guess it should actually be in type.c. That would stand to reason, wouldn't it? Along with these guys. Okay, so now we compile, but we have to get back to so I think it's actually compiling this. Let me just check something here. Okay, yeah, so um, so this is getting accepted now. Um, now, of course, in the back end, we have to figure out how to somehow tell it to do the right thing. This is one of those annoying things. We have to somehow get that information back there. Um, Let me think, maybe there's a slightly better way of doing that where rather than recognizing the conversion here, let me just see where this function is used. Is it only used, okay, it's used here and there. Cast operand, does it do convert operand first? Okay, let's not do casting. Let's do this case. I think the right way to do it maybe is not as part of here because this is supposed to be side effect free. So maybe what we do Um, how do I want to structure this logic? Like basically what I want to say is This is some weird redundant logic. See, that's kind of the problem with the way things work here because the operand is not actually associated with an AST node. It's originally related to an, it's originally created from an AST node or something in an AST node. But, um, boom, boom, boom. 
when we just see an operand, we don't really, I mean, this is one of the problems with the data flow here. Um, actually, you know what, this is probably fine. If, um, We have this notion of expected type, which is used for type inference and a few other things. Um, if you look at the way expected types are used by the generator, in some cases, you can see if there's an expected type Yeah, it uses resolve types and stuff like that. Um, let's look at calls as an example. We already have an any type, uh, Sherlock. This is just for um, creating implicit conversions to it. Um, Let's see. So we don't just want it for functions, but just using that as a model case, let's think about what we need to do. When we're generating the function call, we do this gen expression. We know the type of this thing, the resolve type, we know the expected type. Okay, we can we can do it here, actually. Um, Um, what's the best way to do it? I mean, you basically want to, you can actually detect the need for the conversion here. Basically, if, um, I mean, this is probably not the right place to do it, but let's just, let's try to add it here and then we, we can factor it out later. I think right now, do we have expected expression or something like that? Um, the problem is pretty much any context you might be asked to do this. Like it could be a field of a struct, it could be an assignment. Um, maybe we could do it by saying at the top level, if the expected type, if the expected type is any, but your type is not any, um, is that what it's called? Get expected. get resolved expected type, get resolved expected type is any, um, this is going to slow down the generator because it has to do this lookup for every single expression, but um, this kind of thing will, will go away in the new resolver and generator. But, um, so let's not feel too bad about it. If we are expected to generate an any, but our actual type is not any,
trying to remember how to do all the the type of stuff. Um, oh, easy, gen type ID. Um, So if we expect an any, if we're not an any, um, generate this wrapper. And then here, we generate this. Um, now, right now, I don't believe we fill in the expected type except in a few cases. Um, so let's just verify, right, that we do it for these cases involving init. And so what we have to do well, we can't really do it here. So maybe what we need to do is we I think what we do is we actually do put it just in the convertibility logic generically and then we just detect it elsewhere. Um, oh no, sorry, it's the wrong function. Okay, and we have to do it elsewhere. I mean, you could actually always put in, uh, you, the, the, right now the resolved expected type map is really sparse because it's only sparsely used and so it's needless to fill it up. It c makes things slower than it needs to be with this current design. Like I said, in the long term, we will have a totally different design for data flow and communication between the resolver and generator. But even for now, I think this is fine because we only need it in this case. So we only fill this in if it's needed um, let's try that. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. In this case, I guess you really, Gentide by D doesn't, re I have to remember these functions have side effects. That's how they do their thing. So I just want to do this. Comma, type ID. Let's see. All right. So this is the explicit variant, okay, and I forgot to emit the ampersand. Oh, right. I need to only do this when the unqualified versions are not the same, basically. So Well, let's look at that. So that's test compound literals. So the problem is it's it wants to cast. Well, this this is a literal. Um, let's think about this. So here, the target type is any const. So it's adding an extra layer of wrapping. Um, A little bit messy. I'll, I'll think of a better way to do this. Um,
Oh, I see. That's the issue. Um... That's reasonable. This is reasonable. In fact, these two generate identical code, which is exactly what it should be. Now, one case that won't work is for our values. Um, There's a universal solution, which may or may not do what you want. Um, let's try it. Just always use all value literals. That, and I think that's maybe the right move because what that means is the thing you're past a pointer to when there's implicit any passing is not really the, it's not like, so this doesn't become like a, an implicit reference to the original value. It just becomes a temporary reference that you can use for passing data, but it doesn't, you, you know, you, you can use any for passing you know, direct pointers, but you have to construct them explicitly. I think that's the right move. So we always use L value literals for this. So then I just have to generate a, um, what is it? Uh, the type here. Uh, I guess it has to be type. We can't use type spec. So it's the actual type. I'm trying to remember, this is like a cast. Okay, yeah, we don't need anything in the parentheses. Sweet. Right, so that means this is actually different in the sense that the implicit version gives you always a temporary L value, which I think is the correct semantics because like I said, otherwise it's like implicit references, which is not what I'm going for. You can use the, this for doing direct pointer passing, but then you have to actually construct an explicit pointer. So I think this is the right semantics and it's also special case free. Otherwise we would have to somehow treat the R value case from, uh, of implicit any passing from the L value case, which is uh, I think a, a smell. It, it says that something would be off with those semantics. If you want implicit references, that's a different language feature basically. Um, anyway, that's pretty cool I think. So let's test it with our values. Why won't it let me set breakpoints here? It's 
Sweet! How cool is that? And this is something I had been planning all along but never got back to. But clearly this is sort of the obvious implication of having this feature is being able to do this kind of thing. All right, good night, Juan. All right. How long have we been going? I think only about an hour. It started a little bit late. Hour and 20 minutes. So I guess we haven't gotten a lot done, but uh, you, you'll have to bear with my, my slow coding speed and thinking speed while I get back into the right mindset for this stuff. But um, that's a pretty cool feature. So how can you use this um, for stretchy buffs and other polymorphic things? So one thing you can do is, um, let's actually do a test case right here. Because we already have this project set up. Um, let's see, buff, let's just make it some random thing. push um, maybe we'll just call that stack pointer let's make sure that compiles first of all okay Um, so then you should be able to do something like this, or I mean, this is probably not the version you would use for stretchy buffs. There, you want the types to be homo homogeneous, but uh, homogeneous is. Do you say homogeneous or hom homogeneous? Am I never quite sure? Um, so let's see. This should work. Um, So for this is an integer. If you I have to remember to put oh yeah, so it put that on the stack. So let's 
So you can see it filled in these four bytes, and now it's filling in. Oh, this is not the right thing, actually. <laughs> that, that's pretty funny. It's actually giving the static array. <laughs> which is pretty incredible. I, would, I was expecting to get the, the char pointer, but I'm getting the static array, which is pretty cool, but not really what I would expect. Dependency for the rebuild is totally messed up. I really need to figure that out. Oop. Yeah, you can actually, <laughs> it's actually passing in the right static array size, which is uh, unexpected. I mean, that's useful, actually. It's just not really, like, for example, I mean, the thing is, the, 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 the reason this has a static type is so that for static array initializers and stuff, they, they are static arrays rather than pointers, for example, I think. Um, But probably in this context, you want to actually to generate, or what do I call them, decay them to pointers for this purpose. Um, So what's the right logic for that? Well, we already have pointer decay. Um, What is that called? Oh, type decay. Okay, it's a lot better. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's still a problem. So we're getting the pointer now, presumably. Um, well, actually, let's just look at the test output. Oh, 
Right, so we're getting that here. We're still getting the wrong thing here because we're not looking at the decayed type. This type ID is uh, based on the wrong thing. No, it's not. This looks right. Zero, one, two. So this is the original one, two, three, four, five, six. What's n? Should is that eight? Okay, so that's right. It's just that some of them, some of the upper parts were zero. Okay. Um. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so these were just upper bits that, I guess, lower bit. No, we're a little empty. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Okay, so that 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 was actually correct. It was just confusing me because some of these were were still zero. Um, right. So so this is what I would expect. Um, if you do want to pass static arrays, like with inference for the length of the string, I mean I, that's too magical. <clears throat> that's not what people expect. All right, I'm going to take a quick toilet break and I'll be right back. I, I'll probably go for quite a while uh, today because there's been a bit of a break since last stream. So uh, let me just take a, a, a quick toilet break and I'll be right back. Oh, go for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, that was unintended linguistic ambiguity. Anyway, to, 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 to step a little bit back and think about this kind of feature, what can you use it for? Well, obviously, you, you can use it for printf um, kinds of things. Um, right now, I don't have a variadic version of any, but that's probably something. Like right now, we have C style variadics. Um, it's probably worth doing a type variadic version where you can basically say, I'm trying to remember, All right, so right now we can do this. I think probably the right way to do type variadics is to just allow a, a type here where um, this is the anything goes C style raw memory variadics. If you specify something here, it should basically mean same thing, but things are type checked. Like basically, we statically check that things are actually what what this thing says. Um, 
But the benefit of that is then specifically if you do something like any, then it will generate the any wrappers uh, as part of that. So maybe let's add that feature now. It's not strictly needed, but I'm, I'm just like let's let's round out this feature a little bit now that we have it. Um, I'm trying to remember how we did variatics. Probably it's just a flag, right? Uh, bar. Bar arts. Okay, let's extend the parser first. Um, I think it's called TypeSpec, right? Oh, lower case. Um, so let's see. Um, I keep looking for stuff. Um, Access. We parse the name. We need more than one token of look ahead, but we can do the usual trick we do. Um, I think we can do the usual trick we do, which is. Uh, I'm trying to remember what is it we normally do in those circumstances. Um, we do it in a few cases. Like we do it definitely for init assign or init statement. We do a speculative name parse. Because in a Let's see. Um, all right, so I'm 
this case is a little bit more annoying to parse because in this other case we could parse an expression and then we could just validate that it was a name, like in this case. Um, Well, certainly one way to fix the syntax is to, um, what was the example I was looking at? You can do this. Which is much better. Let's do that, actually. That has clean parsing, which is important for us. Our arcs type. Um, So let's see if uh, not is token. It also lets us have a general type spec, which is very nice. Um, Um, so it's getting a little bit long, to say the least. Um, So let's just check that that can make it into the AST um, test VA type. Um, and actually, one thing I realized, let's fix the syntax. One thing I realized with our ellipsis is that we, we always require more than one ellipsis. Actually, I guess C requires always more than one ellipsis. And you can always just have another thing, copy of the same thing as your first mandatory parameter if you want to have a homogeneous list of things, so that's fine. All right. Um, um, well, I don't know. Let's try this. Does this compile? It compiles but it does not make it into semantics. So let's compile that. At this point, we should probably just do a memcomp rather than this shit, to be honest. Um, can we just do that? 
now because these are spread out. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. Nah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so now. You know what, maybe semantically we actually want to treat this as void. Um, so void is interconvertible with anything, which it actually is in C. It's a kind of a dummy type, right? Like you can always do stuff like this. So maybe, I don't think we actually support that conversion right now, but we'll find out. Um, but that would be a, a good way of handling these as special cases of each other. Okay, so let's look at, what is it, test VA type, oh I guess we have to, because we have this <laughs> aggressive dead code elimination, uh, VA type. Um, okay. Um, right, so this just gets removed on the C side. But let's now. Um, Now, so this is for actually resolving calls. So we check that we have enough of these. Uh, we go through the params, and we have to basically go beyond that. Oh, so that's what we do here. Um, Convert operand. You know what? Let's get rid of the type void thing. Um, let's see, resolve, expected, express my value, and it's func type, func, or args type.
Um, so that's the arg. And you know what? The way we're going to do this is we're actually going to unify it because otherwise we're just going to end up bifurcating this stuff too much. And so this will be um, Now, what happens if I do this? Sweet! I should be able to do other things that are interconvertible, like this. Okay, but of course the real payoff is when we get any in the picture. <clears throat> so let's see here. If we now do this is called print all. Print any's. Uh, let's see here, little for arc stuff. Cards. We still don't have the number of arguments. We never put that in. Um, okay, let's 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 do a shitty printf thing. Uh, we should put that into var args where you get. It infers the length of the argument list and passes it as a prefix parameter. Maybe it should always do that anytime you have. But that kind of creates implicit parameters and makes the things a little bit more complex to say the least. Uh, we need a way to get the length of the parameters with a new special keyword or something. Um, yeah, let's let's put that off. Let's just do this version first, which is just printf with polymorphic arguments. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, 
Um, okay, let's say this is the start here. While uh, it's not equal to Stupid way of doing it. Let's just do it this way. Um, This code. Um, so we write everything up to the last character, we advance this, and then of course we want to um, VA arc arcs. Um, I forgot we did a weird version of this. I'm going to remind myself. This is like any on any craziness. Okay. So it's an any, and you have to say. For the final, I'm sure there's some typos. Unexpected token const in type. Oh, it's because I have to get back to Ion where things are in the proper order. VA arcs, I guess it's just VA arc. Okay.
because I still be freedom pilot anyway not important um, okay this is such a low level API if I screw it up I'm not sure so VA start. VA start. Args format. Oh, I think I have an idea. We have to. It's very likely. If you look at the printf any here, it's not. Okay, so this actually is constructing this part of it. Yeah, that part looks good to me. Now for this part, probably we shouldn't use any for var args. We should use some kind of void type that is just like accepts anything and then on the C side we will do something similar. Let me just go and remind myself of what this thing looks like. Um, I think that's incorrect. I think this should be some mem copy. Um, oh, but you can't because of this. Um. Let me remind myself what the C standard says. 
think you can use VAR with pretty much anything. You know what, though? I guess that doesn't really work. It's a little bit circular. So you specify the type you want. Um, This is kind of a gap in the lower level interaction with sea stall marks. Um, how do I want to deal with that? Okay. Something that I think will help with that, actually, will fix it basically, is um, we need to introduce a void type that will serve as a sync for everything the way it is in C. And I'm pretty sure we don't have that as an emerging property right now. If we have that, we could actually support void as a parameter value, which basically just means anything can go here. Um, and then that's what we would treat the variadic arguments as. Um, so let's uh, let's put that temporarily on hold while we fix that. Uh, test void. Uh, test void. Okay, what do we want to test? Well, first off, if I do this, it's not valid. Don't think so. So um, let's just make that valid. Is convertible. Look at the C code test void. All right, let's leave and see. With that in mind, let's actually go back and we have this whole null thing. Let's actually make this type void. So 
So that works. Uh, var args type. We can also get rid of these guards. And so, okay, so that was a cleanup um, for that. Um, and now let's. So, so in other words, now C style, uh, C, C style var args are actually still typed, they're just typed to void. The convertibility rules just handles the expected behavior for that. Um, but now what we can do is we can go to uh, what is that what what is that called standard arg um, and we can make make that void. We can only really do this with foreign stuff, but the type system will happily deal with it. Then, with, then we will just make this a macro. Function parameter cannot be void. Well, that's true, kind of. Um, This definitely means that we can. Uh, one more thing. Uh, this definitely means that this. We, we, if, if I remove this, you'll be able right now to write code that will generate C compiler errors. But but let's just remove it. I think uh, I'll have to think about how we want to deal with that on the C side more generally. Um, I think this will just be basically, and this will just be used as an interface to magic functions that are implemented as macros that are sort of polymorphic. Um, Okay, well, that's totally expected because there's a ton of var arc stuff. So the way this would have to change, essentially, is that um, well, first of all, let's not get rid of the old code. Let's just stub it out and make sure that's actually the thing that's provoking failures. That I need to go and rewrite um, this thing. I think all this will be. is varg um, uh, 
No, so that doesn't give you the type ID. That's really the problem, isn't it? So that doesn't actually fix that problem. So, so the way we were doing it before, we had these static types. Um, um, I don't feel too bad too bad about going into the weeds about this because we need to have a good story for this anyway if we're going to uh, round out the compiler and language. So. Um, on the C side, of course, you provide this thing. So, so the underlying VA arg macro or intrinsic, you provide the type name. Um, certainly what I could do is I could literally just have special code generation for VA arg specifically. Um, that doesn't seem right. Let's think. Let me think for a bit. The thing that's annoying about this interface is really the only thing you care about is copying memory. Like what you want to say is number of bytes this much. Um, maybe. Let's temporarily revert to the any approach. Let me do an experiment and see. I'm just going to do it here because there's some code I can actually do. I don't want to have to set up a test project. Um, If I do Audio became a lot quieter. Uh, let me see, did it really get significantly quieter? Maybe I just, I'm talking softer. Let me, maybe I moved the microphone away from the mouth. I'm not sure why it would drop by itself. Okay. Um, right, 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 right. Okay, so try, uh, let's see. Can I actually Let's see here? Okay, wrong. Start project. Now, one thing I'm curious about, 
if I do Well, I mean, first of all, I would not expect this to compile, but I'm curious if right. So that doesn't work because otherwise, I could do something like you know, I could do something like this. Um, all right, I think this is actually barking up the wrong tree. Um, I should just do. I should just treat VARG as an intrinsic. Uh, I can still treat it using void in the type system, but for the back end, I should just treat it specially, even though that's a little bit. Um, a little bit weird. Um, so the question is, how do you do? How do you do that? Um, Let me think. Um, So you need to basically recognize, you need to recognize when you're dealing with an intrinsic, which is a function-like thing that has special backend semantics. Um, you know, so for example, if this was like the classical kind of intrinsic that corresponds to CPU instruction, it, that's how it would get handled as well. But it would here we're uh, doing it a little bit weird that way. Um, we probably need a notion. So right now we're tre we were treating it as a foreign function, but just has an, but that's, that's an honest to goodness function, but has an external implementation. I think what you want to do is you want to add an intrinsic, you want to add an intrinsic keyword. You want to enforce that you cannot treat intrinsics as function pointers. Um, Because you, yeah, you you can't do that. They're they're function like, but you can't treat them as function pointers. Um, and then you can do backend specific stuff. So maybe we just need to introduce that concept of intrinsics. Um, so let's see. So std arg. Um, this will become an intrinsic. This will be void. This will be intrinsic. Um, I think the way we handle that in the type system is we need a special flag. Um, we should stop adding Booleans, um, but I'm going to continue the trend. 
but really this is at the point where you should have a bit vector instead. Um, but for now, let's just uh, do it that way. Yeah, I mean, this is getting extremely absurd. My apologies. This is getting to the breaking point where I'm going to absolutely factor this out. That's fine. Um, this is resolve type spec, right? A type spec by itself is never intrinsic. Um, that's really a feature of specific declarations like this one. Um, so here you have a decal. There's something about notes. Um, All oh, right, we need to fill in all these names. That's some lex. Intrinsic name. Oh, I just misspelled. <sighs> and boom, 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 boom. let's see. So now it should be funneled down to the types. First, let's disallow intrinsics from being used in a function pointer context. Um, let me think about how you do that. So normally when you reference something by name, I think you use convertible. If the source type is intrinsic, it's not convertible. And you can't construct type specs corresponding to intrinsic, so we don't have to worry about this kind of catching those cases. Um, so I think what you want to say basically is if, uh, you know, else if uh, dest. Right, is func type is func type. 
uh, source and um, actually let's just make that the very first one just to really emphasize uh, Nah, let's just leave this. Um, if is func type source and source func intrinsic So now let's try uh, let's try just compiling this to make sure we didn't break anything. Okay. Um, now I'm going to try was it varg? Well, we know something downstream is going to, but like for example. Suppose I take um, the same signature, basically. Um, I try doing something like this. Um, let's do another function. Okay, so this error message is not helpful. Um, you probably want to do specific checks for this to get better, better error messages, but um, that's the kind of thing you want. Um, and let me just show that if you get rid of this, I don't think it would complain. Oh, it would. Do we just have an issue with function pointer assignments? Okay, so it is disallowing it there. Maybe it just wasn't recompiling. Um, anyway, that's step one. Now we want to um, go down in the generator and um, 
let's see. So the thing you're calling, there's a few cases. Um, I think what you want to do, so let's see, if it's a callable thing, if it's not a type, in which case we have that special behavior. Um, and this all shares that. I think you actually want to do the following. If sim and sim You have the resolve type, right? Um, I guess it would be like Yeah, let's let's do this instead. Um, so this is for all the other all the other stuff. Um, so gen intrinsic. Let's pass this in. Just put it in a helper here for now. Probably belongs somewhere further out in the resolve. Yeah, actually, let's put this in the resolver. Don't know where it belongs, so I just put it at the bottom. Um, so let's see. If not sim or sim kind is not equal to sim funk and certainly not intrinsic otherwise if you are a sim funk is that right that is a kind so if you're a sim funk you also have a type Just assert it here because it's been a while since I touched this code base. Um, so you should be able to say dot intrinsic. Let's see, sim type. Right. Okay. So for now, I just want this to assert so that we can check that it's getting there. And so now, let's do this, this so it acts like a reference parameter, just like the C function.
right? Um, so at this point, probably what you want to do um, as well do this um, okay so what do we want to do well we basically want to identify certain symbols and we're going to do it um, kind of the way we did it with some of these others um, in fact I'm going to move these well I'm at least going to move this one for now to the built-ins. Um, probably we should just create something called like intrinsics uh, the built-ins. Let's just create that now. Let's see if I remember this directory structure. Um, Maybe maybe the way you get the the symbol like maybe the actual intrinsic is, is called something like this, um, and the one in standard libc is just like an alias. If that makes sense, like you, you can import symbols from other packages and re-export them as your own, which I don't think we've implemented. But um, for now, let's just make it like this. But I think probably what you want to do is there's the actual intrinsic because it has to be in this kind of global namespace. You want it to be some some thing that doesn't conflate and then you can have a nicer name for the thing that people are supposed to use but let's just do it this way for now um, but, but let's leave these these should obviously go there too uh, actually yeah let's put all of them over there now that I think about it um, we don't have to treat these as intrinsics because of the way we set up the function signatures. But actually, I think we probably do have because they're macros in C, and so if you t try to treat them as function uh, pointers, they will not work correctly. So these, we're going to leave them like this for now, but they, they need to be turned into uh, intrinsics as well. Um, all right. So for now, let's just leave this file. Um, So I mean These should probably go somewhere else, uh, but I feel less and less bad since I know this thing is going away to, uh, to just make things expedient for myself. Um, so this is going to be, what was it, uh, VA arg sim. Um, like you want to have some more centralized repository of symbols that are interned for the purpose of, you know, being able to re <clears throat> refer to them in the compiler. Um, so just put this first. So all we're doing there is just looking this up. Let's verify this works. Let's 
So we've entered the built-in package. Strange. Did not end up. Oh. Oops. Can I really not move stuff here? Oh, I guess those have to be carried over as well. Okay, that's in the C code. It's fine. Okay. Um, so now I should be able to say um, And then for this, okay, now finally, we're actually uh, ready to, to generate the code. So what we have to do, I guess one of the problems with the way we expressed it, just in terms of the conventional type system, is that we don't really have a way to check that we have an L value. So we, and the L value-ness is not registered in the resolve type. Um, So actually, well, let's do something. Actually, I think if we pass a pointer, then we could do it. Something like that. Um, So anyway, let's see. So so we we want to do varg um I remember here so call there's args. So the first arg the way we've exposed it, um, it's like a pointer type thing. So we actually, yeah, if you look at what we were doing before, we 
we dereference it. Um, um, this is the part that's really potentially going to just break some things. But um, let's say we'll probably have to reformulate the underlying fungus signature to make it more faithful to what's actually going on. Um, like you have to pass a pointer and then that gets dereferenced. Yeah. So the test one case would still be, you would still write this. Um, come to this part and then we need the actual type name and for that we need um, we need the resolve type of um, the second thing And this has to be a pointer type. So there's essentially extra type checking going on in the back end. Um, and this is, I guess you can say, kind of polymorphic, but um, not unusual. If you think about how intrinsics work in C compilers, they also have magic type checking beyond just this generic type system. So this is OK. Um, so it has to be a pointer type. And we basically have to check the various conditions that the underlying VAR composes. Um, so this thing has to be a pointer type so we can get an L value. Um, let's see. So, okay, so we, we get the type. It has to be a pointer type. Um, now I should be able to get, is it the base? The base type. And I should be able to type to CDECL. I should be able to take the base type. Do something like this and then let's see so this is closing that probably just to make it syntactically unambiguous we have to do this we have to have additional let me just write this here
okay, this is the same thing from before. Um, but let's look at the generated code now, see if we got any. So this would be for test VA list. Looks correct. Um, you actually never want to do it directly with jar because the calling conventions always uh, do the standard integer promotions. So actually. Um, Okay, let's um, see what happens if we do this. Now it should complain. Yep. <clears throat> so, okay, let's find out where the heck this is coming from. Um, I'm trying to remember what the... What I used to do when I wanted to figure out what the like I, I want to disable the pound line. Did I never put in a flag to remove that? Um, let's just let's see. Okay, yeah, don't don't do that for intrinsics. Um, I guess we basically just need to mark it foreign as well, both foreign and intrinsic. I mean, maybe one should imply the other, but uh, I think if we do that, that should address that. Okay. to put in a command line flag to disable this, which is also useful when you just want to generate a finished thing. It's no longer correlated with the ion code. Um, all right, that's pretty cool. I think we've been going for a while now. Let's see, how long are we? Almost three hours. Um, I want to connect the last pieces together with variadic printf any, um, because now we should be able to use this with uh, not just these hard-coded scalar types we had before. And this is, by the way, the need for intrinsics is something I'd been, I don't think I talked about it on stream, but I knew I'd been sort of sidestepping it because I was always trying to, one thing that annoyed me before is I wanted to do more work on the compiler, but I always felt like I was lagging behind on my roadmap for other stuff. So that's part of why I'm kind of blocking out at least, you know, a month and a half, two months uh, for doing compiler work unapologetically now. Um, so it's good to be able to come back and, and, and add these features. And of course, the way these are implemented will be much cleaner in the new version of the compiler. Um, so we, we get to see everything get better. All right. Um, I think this actually handles the case we was we originally pushed the stack to handle. So um, let, well, let's just verify that all this old code now works correctly. 
and it's all nice and polymorphic now. Um, let's just verify that it looks correct. Yep. So, uh, uh, Martin, do you remember when I put in the original VAR cat uh, hack? Because I remember that it was when you were doing your libc port. So it, it's nice to see this being done properly. The the whole any approach was kind of a stopgap, and it only worked with that hard coded list of types. So now we have a proper way of doing these sort of magic functions. That's good to see. Um, like if we ever want, if we want to add actual C intrinsics that have special semantics that are function like, but have maybe even if they're less magic than this, but just in other ways have restrictions. Uh, this is now kind of a good uh, way to do it because it's very easy now. You can see just a sort of like you you add that tag in the uh, you add the intrinsic tag, and then you just add essentially a special case here, and it's just like having another case in your AST. So, but, but the, only the back end has to handle it. You can also add special handling in the resolver, but uh, in cases like this where the type system can still uh, sort of treat it generically and then you only have to change the back end is obviously the ideal. Um, but this is nice. Okay, let's, let's actually go back and finish off the case we started with. So we want to have a printf any, and the case we ran into is that we couldn't do this. Let's see if we can now. So we should just be able to do this, even though arg is a struct type, any is a struct type. So let's, let me just think here. Uh, so we, we print everything we've accumulated and then we pull out uh, an arg and we print that arg and advance. And then we finish off once we're done. Okay. I guess we have to go set the startup project again. of truth yay so we should be able to do heterogeneous data like this using runtime polymorphism Um, so that part didn't work. So it did, well, I guess that's also the function doesn't quite do what I was hoping. Uh, print F any, so print any, uh, Let's pull this out, print any value. Okay. So we already wrote hello. Oh, I guess that's actually a different. Maybe we didn't recompile it correctly or something.
right? Except it didn't print the space, but clearly that's just Okay, so it's almost like, I mean, it must be a really trivial bug with my, with my stuff here. So, so, so let's see. Um, the start starts here. I keep advancing this until I find a terminator. If I find this, I step past it, and then if the next thing is S, then I print everything up to that point, right? FMT minus, so I, everything since last, starting from start, print the value, and then set start right past here. No, oh, that's, sorry. Plus two is totally wrong. It should be um, well. Sorry. I guess you want to do it like this. So now. Cool. So that cleaned up our old mess, uh, C style variadic story. We added type variadics using the C mechanism for the actual low level stuff, but uh, with an extra level of type checking and also implicit type conversion because that's what's happening here with any. Um, and what else did we do? We added a mechanism for additional intrinsics. Um, yeah, so I think that was a good amount of stuff. We didn't actually start porting the compiler, but I think there will there might be a few more sessions like these where I think of stuff that, um, you know, stuff I want to use basically, uh, and that is in any case would need to be done at some point. So I, I think it's already been over three hours. I should stop now, otherwise these videos are going to get uh, even more interminable than they used to be. But I think that's a good start. Uh, I feel pretty good about it. Not a ton of code written in terms of lines of code, but some of this was a little bit intricate, so that's, I think, good enough. Um, and I mean, it, hopefully, you guys can. At some point, I will sh I will show a full. I never really showed the full sort of embedded runtime debugging way you can use this stuff, but um, this whole idea of, of coupling a pointer with a stat with a type descriptor is extremely. You know, like for example, you can take any traditional debug info format and convert it to this sort of thing, or vice versa. Um, so, you know, build visualization and tweaking tools with I am GUI or something like that that is driven uh, by any and type info and stuff. So, uh, but the nice thing about this is this only requires static type info, which is contained in that single 64 bit tag that has all the essential info right there. Right now it doesn't have alignment, but it will. We will actually need that for some of the allocator stuff uh, we'll be doing for uh, for the uh, compiler port. But anyway, good start. Uh, hope people uh, thought that was an okay start. So we'll, we'll um, I guess we're not actually, I tried to stream on uh, close to my normal time, but we're technically on the weekend. Uh, Basically, next week I will try to have completely the same schedule as before. I may have more extra streams, but I will at a bare minimum have my Monday, Wednesday, Friday streams I, I used to have. 
uh, same time as well, 8 a.m. my time, whatever that used to be your time. So uh, yeah, uh, welcome back, and I'm uh, looking forward to doing all this work.